Testing one, two, three. Welcome to another Woke Wednesday. This podcast was created to shed light on different societal issues which have been at the forefront of public discourse through one of the most divisive times in American history. More so, it was created with the intent of allowing those who have often been neglected, shunned, or misunderstood to have a chance to share their experiences and thoughts. I hope this dialogue encourages critical conversation and activism amongst all listeners. And I hope you'll tell all your friends about it and share it on your social platforms. Who child, the White House is in shambles. Not that it already wasn't. After Michael Cohen, former advisor to President Trump, testified in front of the House Oversight Committee. Cohen was sentenced to three years in prison for crimes that included arranging for the payments to silence not one, but two women during the 2016 presidential campaign that claimed they had affairs with President Trump. Which, I'm not trying to be rude. I find nothing attractive about him. So, I mean, to each their own, but ew, that's nasty. During Cohen's seven-hour testimony, he stated that he knew that the president was guilty of multiple financial crimes and had the receipts to prove it. He claimed that collusion with Russia did occur and that he was a racist con man. But I honestly have no feelings about him saying that because he still chose to work with him while everybody told him this man is racist. So I really don't care that he's now saying, oh, he's racist. We've been said that. And y'all remember when Michael Flynn chanted, lock her up numerous times? Well, karma is truly a bitch because it seems as if everyone in the Trump administration is getting exactly what they deserve as the sentences and subpoenas keep coming in. Everyone just needs to be in jail, period. Donald Trump included. And I'm hoping that all of us can get back to this democracy that we want and that we should be passing on to our children so that they can do better than what we did. And so you wonder whether people believe you. I don't know. I don't know whether they believe you. But the fact is that you come, you have your head down, and this has got to be one of the hardest things that you could do. Let me tell you the picture that really, really pained me. You were leaving the prison. You were leaving the courthouse. And I guess it's your daughter had braces or something on Man, that thing, man, that thing hurt me. As a father of two daughters, it hurt me. And I can imagine how it must feel for you. But I'm just saying to you, I want to first of all thank you. I know that this has been hard. I know that you face a lot. I know that you are worried about your family but this is a part of your destiny. And hopefully this portion of your destiny will lead to a better, a better, a better Michael Cohen, a better Donald Trump, a better United States of America, and a better world. And I mean that from the depths of my heart. When we're dancing with the angels, the question will be asked, in 2019, what did we do to make sure we kept our democracy intact? Did we stand on the sidelines and say nothing? Did we play games? And I'm tired of these statements saying, they come, people come in here and say, oh, oh, this is the first hearing. It is not the first hearing. The first hearing was with regard to prescription drugs. Remember, a little girl, a lady sat there, Miss Wortham, her daughter, 
died because she could not get $333 a month in insulin. That was our first hearing. Second hearing, HR1, voting rights, corruption in government. Come on now. We can do more than one thing. And we have got to get back to normal. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Watching the House members question Cohen was truly awe-inspiring because the line of questioning and audacious manner in which it was done was impeccable. My girl, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, was extremely strategic in her questioning by confirming specific questions from her other colleagues that aligned with the idea that Trump's taxes reflected acts of fraud and one of his specific business locations in her home district's area that was funded by the New York people, which obviously outraged them. Ayanna Presley did the same as well when she spoke to the truth of Trump being racist by affirming that idea that someone who denies rental properties to African Americans, leads the birther movement, refers to the diaspora as shithole countries, says that white nationalists are fine people, they can still have a black friend and still be racist. But just because one has a black or brown friend doesn't excuse them from being considered racist or participating in racist acts. Along the lines of race, Rashida Tlaib expressed her opinions clearly and concisely when she referred to Representative Meadows using Lynn Patton a political appointee in HUD as a prop when he brought her out as a clear example that Donald Trump isn't racist. That's literally what he did. He brought this woman out during the testimonies and she stood behind him and he asserted that, well, he can't be racist because he just hired this black woman. Lynn remained silent behind Meadows as he bantered on in opposition to Michael Cohen asserting that Donald Trump is racist when he clearly couldn't be when he has hired an African-American woman to such a high position. And he claimed that Patton herself said that being from Birmingham, Alabama, she could never possibly work for someone that she believed was racist. Well, girl, you're doing it right now. Now, did these words come straight out of her mouth in the committee testimony hearing? No. Have we ever heard her say this? No. Well, Calling out this con concept of tokenism, which this clearly is an example of it, is definitely nothing short of brave by Tlaib. Tokenism is the practice of making a symbolic effort to do a particular thing, especially by recruiting a small number of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of sexual or racial equi equity within a workforce. Tlaib did her job as a congresswoman by reaffirming Presley's point that someone including a black person in their workspace or their personal space doesn't negate that person from being considered racist or participating in racist acts. It's also important to point out that those on the right during these testimony hearings deliberately tried to discredit Cohen's testimony by bringing up different lucrative book deals that he had, as well as other important not important matters that we didn't need to hear about during this questioning. Hmm. I don't know. I'm just saying I feel like the GOP is always trying to make it seem like those in the Trump administration or those that worked for him really aren't as bad as they are. That's just my opinion. In other news, a Coast Guard member went to federal court recently on different gu gun and drug charges. Christopher Hassan possessed illegal silencers, and as news unfolded, it was learned that Hassan was planning a domestic terrorist attack and had 22 prominent liberal media and political officials on his list. He allegedly wrote in an email that he is a longtime white nationalist that was a skinhead before his time in the military, and that you can make a change with a little focused violence. They also found on his computer different web searches in which he looked up Supreme Court justices having security detail and 
where were the best places to see Congress members in D.C.? Who child? This news came in the midst of Smollett accusations. And although it did get some media attention, it wasn't to the same degree as a Smollett case. And it should have been, because white nationalists and domestic terrorists have long been a problem within our country, yet it can be overlooked to some degree by media outlets, political institutions, and more. Now, let's get into this week's episode. I've recently been reading a book entitled White Fragility, Why Is It So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism? The book was written by Robin D'Angelo, an American academic lecturer that studies whiteness through an analytical lens. What we're going to talk about today in this episode might make you uncomfortable. And to be honest, that truly doesn't faze me because as a black woman in America, purely existing has been an uncomfortable experience for me all of my 23 years of living. We're discussing the concept of white supremacy and white fragility through the lens it should be talked about, not through a lens of subscribing white supremacy only to different white nationalist groups and overtly racist people and acts. Although recognizing these bigoted groups and people are important, the overlying cause of racial discrimination and racial bias stems from a long historical and systemic trends that America was literally founded on should be highlighted to the extent it impacts black, brown, and other marginalized communities. So what does white fragility mean exactly? To be white in so many ways is to be raised, to be functionally illiterate on the topic of race. I am white, uh, and part of being white is that I was not raised to see myself in racial terms. I mean, I understood that somebody had race, but not really me. To be white is to see oneself outside of race, to see oneself as a unique, special individual exempt from the forces of socialization. I'll never forget a moment of standing beside a black man leading a workshop on race and a white woman said to him, I don't see color. He said, well then how are you going to see racism? Because I am black. I do think you know that and I have a different experience than you do. And you're not gonna be able to understand that and you're not gonna be able to support the parts of that experience that are really painful and problematic if you refuse to acknowledge my reality. I don't see color is really a way of saying I refuse to acknowledge your reality. What's important about that narrative is it reveals what the person thinks racism is. So if the person is using proximity, fondness across race as evidence of a lack of racism, in order for that to be good evidence, a racist must not be able to do that. So that rests on an understanding that a racist cannot tolerate proximity to people of color. And I'm hoping that we can see that's pretty absurd because trust me, even avowed racists can tolerate being around people of color and often are. You cannot talk about any other issue without talking about how race informs that issue. And when someone says it's about class, that tends to function as a way to get race off the table. First of all, we're already divided by race. Uh, And focusing on race is is not what did it. I would say not focusing on race, refusing to grapple with how race shapes virtually everything is what keeps us divided. And that is a very white narrative. All of those narratives function to get race off the table, close the exploration, exempt the person from any further engagement, and protect the racial hierarchy and the white position with it, which is an unequal hierarchy. The challenge I want to offer my fellow white people is changing the question from if to how. So dominant culture asks if I'm racist, and I want to change that question to How have I been shaped by the forces of racism? How is racism manifesting in my life? Because it circulates 24-7, 365. None of us can be and none of us were exempt from its forces. And this is where individualism can come in. I have a particular story, but that story didn't exempt me. And so I can ask myself, how did all the things I see as unique about me set me up into the overall racist structure? Because it did.
Well, it's born from the belief that allows white people to be socially conditioned to maintain the, their superiority and entitlement. White people have been taught, honestly, since the colonization of America, that whiteness is a standard for humanity and people of color are a deviation from that norm. It's interesting because white people typically don't acknowledge their whiteness because it's assumed to be a universal norm and has been imposed on everyone. Yet black people and brown people have always had the obligation of recognizing how our skin tone will impact our everyday life decisions. The ones we make ourselves and the ones that are made by government and political institutions. Moreover, challenging the status quo of whiteness often evokes anger, guilt, and fear from white people because to challenge what's considered the norm means to insinuate that the opinions and viewpoints of the dominant culture equate the dominant culture to being immoral and bad people. It also reflects the hypocrisy in two big ideals held within dominant Western cultures, those ideals being individualism and objectivity. Individualism asserts that we're all unique, even within our own social groups, and objectivity is the feeling that it's possible to be free from all bias. Individualism reinforces this claim that race is irrelevant because it asserts that there are no built-in barriers to success and any failures is based on individual character, not on social structures. But that's a fucking lie because there are literally systems built and still enforced today that keep the dominant culture at the top and other people at the bottom. For example, in 2016 and 2017, 96% of the U.S. governors were white. Those who directed the top 100 grossing films of, films of all time were white. The owners of men professional football team, 97% of them are white. And much more. The groups I'm talking about here represent power, control, the ability to protect their own self-interest across an entire society. Like I said, this episode wasn't meant to make people comfortable, but to acknowledge the part they play in a racially disproportionate system. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when one thinks of white supremacy, they immediately think of the KKK or the alt-right groups that protested in Charlottesville. Yet, it's so much more than that. Of course, most white people don't identify with these groups or ideologies, but when talking about white supremacy in the way it should be talked about, it captures the superiority of people defined and perceived as white and the practices based on that their definition. We're looking at the overarching political, economic, and so social system of domination that circulated not just in America, but globally. It's an unnamed political system that has made the modern world what it is today. Because for literally ever, the status quo has been what it is. White people, and even people of color at times, have been complicit and invested in this system that's built to benefit them. It will only continue to be this way as long as we continue investing in and voting for mediocre and complicit politicians and lawmakers, no matter what the color. To me, Talking about racism and its complexities has never been particularly hard because, <laughs> hello, I'm black. But also to that point, being a minority in this country means to be deeply invested in the struggle of getting to where we would like to be in spite of the barriers set in place to stop us. It doesn't excuse white people solely because they're white, not to be aware of their own racial biases, tendencies, and complicity in a hierarchy that only benefits them. It's also not a person of color's job to always have to educate white people on the complexities of race and our experiences altogether. We're not obligated to do that. And on that note, I'm well aware that the term people of color is an umbrella term, but I also feel like it's an excuse, not just for white people at times, but for people in general, just not to say black or brown. If you are referring to black people, it's okay to say black people. 
We are referring to Latinas, Hispanics, Indians, whatever the case is. It is okay to say that specific demographic. I don't, I think it's very telling that sometimes we often use these umbrella terms as an excuse not to just say what we're really meaning. Just wanted to throw that out there. In other news, if you didn't know, I'm well aware, I'm typically who you hear from on Wednesday nights. However, I'm not the only person that's involved in this podcast. My producer, Trey, who's one of my best friends, he also had a very interesting perspective specifically on this topic because he's white and a male. Now, for him, he wouldn't say that it's any one person's responsibility to assure everyone is woke enough on racial issues. Personally, he was not fully aware of the full range of complexities of his own implicit bias as a white male until he entered college. And honestly, he's still learning, like we all are. And he believes that that's the first step in combating the different forms of white supremacy and other regressive social tendencies for that matter. By remaining open to continuously learning from others and being receptive to ideas which challenge dominant culture and traditional norms of thinking, which keeps segments of society oppressed. This should be a habit outside of reception to social issues. If you become stagnant as a human, not growing or learning, it becomes difficult to live a fulfilling life amidst the progression of culture itself. He also commends people for being receptive to all groups willing to learn and grow, to not judge anyone, comment too harshly, or condemn any person to where he or she are unable or unwilling to learn from mistakes and grow in understanding and empathy. This is where learning from alternative voices is so crucial. Now, in terms of white fragility, he thinks that there's just as many nuances to subgroups in white culture as there are to subgroups in marginalized communities, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Certain segments of white society become dangerously content with a form of traditional idealism particularly in Southern culture, that limits progressive growth. These geographic differences also mark white supremacy in different ways, with Southern political trends reflecting a shift from overt racism and sexism to more nuanced neo-traditional practices, which still perpetuates regressive ideology. Being from the South, I cannot speak on behalf of New England white culture or Midwestern white culture, But one thing about communication, sharing truth, and learning that it takes more than just attacking someone online or blocking someone to rid the culture of these regressive tendencies. From his perspective, it takes attacking the dominant culture itself through all sorts of ways, subtle and extreme, in order to reshape language and culture through more progressive means. And this still does not mean that all subgroups and individuals will adhere to these new forms of cultural shifts or even acknowledge them. But the fact that they are present, the fact that there are more truths out there to be heard and to be digested will make some form of difference. However, this is all coming from an optimist, so who really knows? It's also important to note that this alteration of dominant culture should not come at the expense of the culture itself. He personally loves being a Southerner and being from Georgia. He just wants to see the best version of Southern culture evolve. I hope that this episode was informative and thought-provoking for all that listen and for those that will listen in the future. I hope that recognizing the system of racism as a multi-complex institution that propelled America as a dominant and oppressive country is not only challenged more, but diminished altogether. Black people, brown people, and disempowered communities have always been at the focal point that advance our country into the institution of equity and justice that it should have been from the start. In order to move our laws, policies, and plans forward, creating spaces in which all people are allowed to do so has to happen. Remember, all of these opinions are my own, but they should be everyone else's. Have a woke
Thank you for another Woke Wednesday. Transcripts of entire episodes will be available on the Woke Wednesday website. Episodes are written and produced by Hannah Mason and Trey Leonard of Lenico Entertainment. Episodes are hosted by Hannah Mason and edited by Trey Leonard. All graphics are designed by Anna French, 